Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Melissa Page Nichols, and I am pastoral counselor on staff with Campus Ministry here at King's University College. Tonight, we begin the second half of the Veritas series for faith and culture for this 2014-2015 academic year. And we are most honored to have Dr. Ingrid Matson with us this evening to offer the first lecture of this new year. And now I am very pleased to invite Hassan Mustafa, President of the Board of Directors of the Islamic Centre of Southwest Ontario, to introduce our speaker. I greet you with the words of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very honoured to be here. And um, before I introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Matson, I want to speak just a little bit about friendship. It's a difficult world we live in today, but in the Muslim community here in London, we're very proud and we're very honored of the bonds and the friendships that we've created with interfaith communities, both with King's College, here on College, <coughs> excuse me, with many of the churches and with many of the synagogues. And um, at a time where people want to commit violence and use the mask of religion to do so, it's always great to fall, by, to fall back on friendship and, um, and, and move forward. And so we honor your friendship, we thank you for your friendship. And um, having said that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Matson. Dr. Matson is a religious scholar. She is an expert in interfaith relations. Since 2012, she's been the chair of Islamic studies at Huron, at the Windsor, London and Windsor Community Chair of Islamic studies at Huron. Dr. Matson was educated in Canada, just from down the road in the, on, on the 401 from the Kitchener-Waterloo area. She earned a PhD in Near Eastern language, Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago. From 1998 to 2012, she was the Professor of Islamic Studies at Hartford Seminary in Connecticut, where she developed and directed the first accredited graduate program for Muslim chaplains in America, and served as director of the McDonald Center for the Study of Islam and Christian-Muslim Relations. Dr. Matson has long been active in the Muslim religious communities. From 2001 to 2010, she served as vice president and then as president of the Islamic Society of North America, the first woman to serve so in either position. Her writings, both academic and public, focus primarily on Quranic interpretation, Islamic theology, ethics, and interfaith relations. Her book, The Story of the Quran, is an academic bestseller and was chosen by the U.S. National Endowment for the Humanities for Inclusion in its Bridging Cultures program. Dr. Matson is also a senior fellow at the Royal Ahlul Bayt Institute for Islamic Thought in Amman, Jordan. From 2009 to 2010, Dr. Matson was a member of the Interfaith Task Force of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. In 2008, she was on the Council for Global Leaders of the C100 of the World Economic Forum. Dr. Matson is also the recipient of numerous awards as well as honorary doctorates from Trinity College in Hartford and the Chicago Theological Seminary. We're very honored um, to introduce Dr. Ingrid Matson. Thank you, Dr. Hassan Mustafa, for that introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful to, to Dr. Mustafa and to so many others uh, from this community, from the community of London and the community of Windsor, the, the people, the communities that gave uh, the name of the chair that I hold, the London and Windsor Community Chair in uh, Islamic Studies. I'm so grateful and really honored and feel blessed to occupy a chair that is has been funded and named after communities um, because so many of my colleagues hold chairs that are named after millionaires or monarchs or billionaires. So I feel really, you know, more uh, rooted in the people uh, with this. So I'm grateful to that. I'm also, of course, very grateful to uh, King's University College and um, especially for uh, the Center for Jewish Catholic Muslim Learning here that uh, has sponsored this lecture. Um, I'm uh, so happy to have good uh, and uh, good colleagues and also friends, as, as Hassan said, uh, here. It's wonderful um, being in colleges that bring a, a uh, 
a life of faithfulness and also a critical eye to uh, religious studies um, to the Western campus, I think we fulfill um, a very important role in, uh, in the world today. Um, religion is a part of people's experiences, whether uh, we like it or not, and uh, at a minimum, we should understand the world in which we live. So teaching about religion uh, should be part of every, um, you know, every educated person's uh, uh, education at some point, and to be able to also have a place um, to live faithfully is also important in a nation where freedom of religion and expression is, uh, is so critical to the values and identity. So I'm grateful to be, to be here and also to be back in Canada. <clears throat> Uh, today, I'm talking about the story of Joseph, and I chose this because it is one of my favorite stories ever, um, uh, not just one of my favorite stories in the Quran, but I thought it was particularly appropriate also for this lecture series because it's a story that is well known by all the so-called Abrahamic traditions, um, by uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Um, it is a story that we share. It's a story that is told both within our scripture and also outside of scripture. There are all sorts of retellings of the story of uh, Joseph um, in the Islamic tradition. We have a, uh, there, there's a very developed miniature tradition of um, uh, illustrations of this story in Persian and Ottoman manuscripts. There are plays about it in, the, uh, in India. Um, of course, there is a contemporary modern play about it, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. So the story, this is a story that has engaged our imagination from very, very ancient times, told even before it was written down uh, in the Bible or the Quran, and it goes on in a retelling afterwards. Um, so, uh, so we all have, I think, I don't have to tell the basic story to people, it's also helpful to, to have uh, pretty much all of your audience know generally the back story. Um, the story of Joseph is told in the Quran in one of the surahs. A surah means a, is often translated as chapter, although that doesn't quite translate exactly. Uh, the Quran has 114 surahs, some that are very short, just a few verses, and some that are very long, um, hundreds of verses. Uh, the story of Joseph is a, is a medium, shortish to medium, uh, uh, long chapter. Um, and it is special and unique within the Quran for a number of reasons. Um, to understand why it is special, uh, we first have to um, know that the Quran contains many different forms of communication, all of which Muslims believe are the word of God. So uh, everything that is within the Quran is a revelation that came from God through the prophet, to the prophet Muhammad as the messenger of God. So the Quran is, is God's message that was conveyed through his, his prophet and then given to the people. Um, but in this, in this revelation, which was revealed over 23 years, bit by bit, there are many different forms of communication. And by that, I mean um, that there are some stories, although those are a small part, but there are also legal rulings, there are supplications, there is the praise of God, there are descriptions, eschatological descriptions, descriptions of the afterlife and the day of judgment. Um, so there's many different um, messages, uh, stories, uh, prayers, and passages in the Qur'an. Um, a word that could be translated as, as story, uh, if, if you go to an English translation of the Qur'an, you might find uh, very often in a number of verses they'll, they'll use the word story, but the Arabic word qisla is not used very often. Usually um, what is conveyed is, is news, neba, or uh, a parable, methal, or a hadith. Uh, the word hadith is used, report. Um, so what is the difference between all of these narratives um, and a story? Um, this story 
has a specific meaning. It is a narrative that's told uh, about something that has happened in a particular format. And you'll see this if you, if you look at the Quran and you look at these different words that are translated as narrative, that story has a particular meaning. Um, and the uh, Surah Joseph, the chapter of Joseph, begins um, very early on in this chapter are the words, we will narrate to you the most beautiful story. Um, and to this uh, extent, when we look at the story of Joseph as story, we are not engaging in a met metaphorical um, interpretation of the Quran. So we have to think a little bit uh, at the beginning here about hermeneutics, meaning what is the proper way to read the Quran? When we read the Quran, how do we look at it? Now, of course, people can look at it from whatever perspective they like. From an, but for a Muslim, for a believing Muslim, an observant Muslim, there are certain things that we begin with. One, that this is the word of God. So that is, is a, a, a belief that Muslims will have that uh, non-Muslims generally will not have. The question then is, if a Muslim believes this is the word of God, how do we understand it? How do we interpret it? And very often we hear phrases like, um, you know, because Muslims believe that the Quran is the literal word of God, they are, and the, the assumption or the conclusion is, they are literalists, scriptural literalists. And that's not quite true because, uh, well, the all Muslims believe that the Quran is the verbatim word of God. That doesn't mean that all forms that the Quran is read in a completely decontextualized manner or in a manner in which um, uh, the uh, words can't have some ambiguity or uh, be polysemic, meaning that, that there could be many meanings to the same word or that we don't have to contextualize scripture. So there are many tools, exegetical tools, or tools of interpreting the Qur'an that are applied to the text. So for example, the first level is linguistic. What does a word mean? What did the word mean in that time? Is it different than how we understand uh, what that word means? Could there be many different meanings? Then there's the question of grammar. While well, something can be phrased in a general um, uh, verbal form, it might actually imply or signify a specific um, ruling, or it may uh, signify one person, even though the wording is very general. There's also the issue of the historical context of abrogation, where some verses abrogated by others. So there is a whole toolbox um, that is brought to understanding what the Quran means. So we all know what the Quran says. The question is, what does it mean? And here is where we'll find a wide range of interpretations. Now, there are some schools of Islamic thought that uh, will interpret the Quran through a metaphorical lens. Um, in particular, if you look at some of the um, the uh, Shiite schools of thought, there is more application of metaphorical interpretation. And by metaphorical interpretation, I mean where some passages that seem fairly straightforward will be interpreted metaphorically. So for example, the sun will be interpreted as a metaphor for God and the moon as a metaphor for Ali and the uh, clouds as a metaphor for an oppressive ruler, etc. So these are, this is metaphorical or a symbolic reading of what's in the Quran. The majority of Muslims, the majority of mainstream Muslims do not engage in that kind of metaphorical interpretation. They try to stay to as strict of a, a what you could maybe say a plain reading of the text um, to try to understand linguistically what it meant um, culturally what it signified, historically um, in that context when it was revealed and who it was speaking to. So there is context, there is linguistic analysis, 
but not a metaphorical or symbolic reading of the Quran. But here we see a, a vast range of ways of interpreting the Quran. But what I want to say is that, that if you engage uh, strictly in a straightforward, you know, uh, um, plain reading of the Quran, not a metaphorical reading, you must read the story of Joseph as a story. Not, to, not meaning that it's fabricated, but that it is in the genre of the story because the Quran itself says this is a story. Right? It uses the word story with respect to this. So by, by calling it a story, we're not applying a metaphorical meaning. We're, we're actually giving a very literal reading of, of the text. Now, what does it mean if something is a, is a story? Well, what are some of the elements of a good story? If this was a classroom, this is where I would ask you to call out some of the elements of a good story. But I'm not sure of the acoustics here and how, how comfortable you'll be. So I'll just, I'll just call out some of the things and um, you'll probably recognize them. A good story has a plot. Um, has a plot that uh, hopefully has some twists and turns and ups and downs and ultimately comes to some form of resolution or might leave you hanging. It could be a story um, that at the end is unresolved but in a way that, that leaves you with something to think about. A good story should have strong characters. Um, strong characters who are vivid, who are, if they're human, they show some of their humanity. They, they eat, they have family relationships, they have intimate relationships. Um, a good story has vivid settings and uh, very often the, a, a setting that is, that is tight is better. And what I mean by tight is you can think of, uh, you know, when you watch TV, how often does a sitcom take place? This is a standard sitcom setting, right? It's someone walks in the, fr the front door opens right into the living room and there's the couch and everyone sits on the couch and behind them is the stairs. So there's some movement, but all of the action uh, occurs or most of the action occurs in this tight little living room setting, usually this one couch or a couch and maybe another chair. Or you think of some of the movies you watch and how often it's, it's this closeness. So a setting that frames the action and that supports the message. Um, a theme, a story should have, should have a theme. You know, what is this story about? And the story doesn't have to be about just one thing. It might have layers of meaning. It have, might have multiple themes. It might have something that's on the surface and something that's a little deeper. Um, a story has to do something with dialogue. Some stories have a lot of dialogue. Some have very little. But whatever dialogue there is in there should move the action forward or should, should somehow um, not be just, um, just thrown in there to fill pages, but, but really relates to uh, the structure and theme of the story. Uh, a good story has conflict, um, and that conflict brings action and it brings excitement. Uh, it brings uh, um, visual interest. Um, and it also offers the opportunity for, uh, for further action and, and resolution. And then finally, um, if it is a story that is told orally, it should have some elements that make it interest it, uh, interesting orally. Uh, oral stories, a good story that is told out loud will have repetition because there's only so much you can remember, so you need to kind of come back to a theme or have certain words or, or phrases repeated or come back to a character. And uh, it should have in the words itself a kind of rhythm or pattern. It should be interesting to listen to. It should be, should be enjoyable. There should be something in the cadence of the storytelling that, that makes it uh, delightful. Um, in my view, the story of Joseph has all of these things. 
Uh, it has all of these things, and it is why it is a beautiful story, why it's a great story, because it, it's not just because it has a good message, but because it conveys the message, it conveys meaning through these elements of storytelling that, is, that are extremely en engaging. And to this extent, I would say that this is a way for the Quran to teach us, for God to teach us something about storytelling. That there is a way to tell a good story. This is how you do it. And good storytelling is important enough that I've included it in my book. Uh, this is something that uh, scholars, uh, pre-modern or classical Islamic scholars discussed. Uh, they discuss storytelling and um, the importance of it. And they told it in the context of a society where there was a lot of storytelling that was going on um, uh, for not very positive reasons or not very healthy reasons. Of course, the, uh, you know, the ancient Near East, like any society, had a lot of people telling stories for money or to seduce women or to scare people. Um, Whatever kind of stories we think there are today, there are those stories that we think are forms of art, that are forms of, um, uh, that are educational stories, that are moralistic, positive stories. We also think about stories that are really seem to appeal to the most degraded aspects of human nature. And this is, this is uh, the reality in any society, as I say, and early Islamic society also faced this. So sometimes there was a negative um, assessment of storytellers, particularly because if, if, if there were competing on one block a very good storyteller and a rather boring preacher, uh, most people went to the exciting storyteller. So there's a number of really interesting narratives in the first centuries of Islam about, about scholars, very good, serious, rigorous scholars who would be sitting in the mosque and they would be preaching and teaching. And as they're sitting there with their half dozen uh, uh, students or mentors around them, uh, they would hear a lot of noise coming in from the streets and send someone out to, to see what was going on. And lo and behold, there was one of these uh, uh, storytellers who made his living by putting a hat in front of him, telling some crazy, uh, wild story with a lot of people, a lot of the commoners standing around and just being in am amazement at these stories he was telling. And very sometimes they were stories of ancient people, of ancient prophets, and this, of course, the uh, religious scholars objected to because they were telling things that were untrue about great figures like the prophets or about righteous people um, or their theology when they talked about things like the creation of the world. Their theology was off and they had all sorts of anthropomorphistic um, aspects into their storytelling. So when they spoke about God, uh, they, were, they were saying things that from a theological point were, um, were objectionable, but made a good story. Um, but the thing that storytellers love to talk about more than anything was uh, heaven and hell and the day of judgment. The, the most common theme was the apocalypse and what would happen after death. Um, if you think that only people that... that um, that the walking dead and the obsession with the walking dead is, is a completely modern phenomenon. You don't know anything about the uh, ancient Near East. I mean, people have always loved these stories. And so the sober religious scholars were, were always a little bit worried about this. But the solution, the solution was to become a better storyteller yourself or make sure that you had uh, storytellers who knew their craft but all, also had sound theological training so that when they told a story, they wouldn't uh, deviate from what was, the, what was orthodoxy. So we have someone like um, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, 
who wrote the book Kitab al-Qisas wa Mudhakkirin, the book of the storytellers and the the um, preachers or those who would, would remind others. And he says, look, you we need to have those people who know how to tell a good story. That is part of what um, how people learn their religion. It's uh, many ordinary people, in those terms they use the term the masses, al-amma or the general people, uh, the illiterate people. It's the only way they learn the religion. And they're not, they neither have the time nor the interest to sit uh, in the mosque for these long religious lessons and um, lectures about all sorts of aspects of right belief and, and uh, law. So you need people who, are po who can popularize um, the moral teachings. And so given that that's the case, then uh, you know, do it right. If, you, if we need storytellers, we need storytellers who can do it right. Now, the other thing I want to say about um, the existence of the story of Joseph in the Quran is that it is not only here that the Quran is self-aware of the importance of, the f of its own form. And what I mean by that is that the Quran is is uh, both a mess is a message, but it's a message that is delivered in a particular form. And the form of it is very beautiful. Um, the Quran is filled with rhyme. It has patterns of rhythm. Um, it has all sorts of elements that are uh, that we can recognize from poetry, um, uh, and uh, and other forms of it's it's not all, it's not recognizable poetry but as poetic elements um, and then when it is recited and the Quran originally is a recitation Quran means the, the recitation so it is originally oral it should be recited in a beautiful sing-song voice which is what tajweed is it is a it is a beautification of the recitation um, so attention is paid to to pitch to rhythm and pacing of the recitation of the Quran. So this idea that, that, the, that of course God would give his message in a beautiful form. Um, and so let's look then at this beautiful story of Joseph in the Quran and see why it is a good story, uh, why it is a beautiful story. So first of all, we have a plot and as I, um, said earlier, probably most of you know the, the, the generally the plot of this story. Uh, there are some differences with the Joseph story in the Quran and the Bible, so let's just go over the plot quickly. In the Quranic story, it begins with Joseph having a dream, and he uh, tells his uh, father about his dream, um, and in his dream, he, um, his brother's were, uh, uh, well, he saw 11 planets and the sun and the moon prostrating before him. His father says, don't tell your brothers about this dream because they will plot against you. Here we have some foreshadowing. What happens is, of course, Joseph's brothers plot against him. They... Uh, decide that um, they're going to take him out. One of the brothers, who's not named, pleads with them not to kill him, but just get rid of him. And so uh, Jacob does not um, trust his sons. He knows something's going to happen. He has insight, and this is an, an important aspect of the story, uh, that the prophets have insight into people's motives and intentions and what's going to happen. Um, so he doesn't trust them, but he lets them go ahead. They take Joseph, they throw him in a well, and they bring back Joseph's shirt with blood of, a, of an animal that they have killed, um, saying, see, a wolf has eaten, has eaten Joseph, attacked him, killed him, and this is all that is left, this bloody shirt. Uh, Joseph's father 
doesn't really believe him, believe them. And they say, oh, you'll never believe us <laughs> when we tell you this story. And he says, no, I don't believe you. You have, you have somehow uh, made this up, but I'm going to be patient. Patience is a big theme of this story. Joseph's in the well. He's pulled out of the well by a passing caravan. They take him. They say, oh, we can do something with this boy. They bring him all the way uh, to Egypt. He is sold as a kind of houseboy or adopted boy. And now he is in a foreign land. He grows up there uh, uh, and he reaches uh, puberty. He becomes a young man and the woman of the house tries to seduce him. Uh, as she is, he's attracted to her, but he is God-fearing, and so his fear of God keeps him from uh, engaging in um, uh, unlawful intimacy with this woman. So we have this, this aspect of the story, which is this, uh, this scene, the seduction, seductive, uh, seduction scene, which is uh, probably part of 90% of good stories, uh, that there is so there is this this scene um, he is he runs away from her and there's this very vivid moment where as he's running away from her she grabs his shirt to pull him back and the shirt rips now f hell hath no fury like a woman scorned so now she accuses him of trying to seduce her Someone says, uh, well, you know, we've got a he, he said, she said situation here. How will we know what the truth is? How do you know the truth? And this person says, well, look at his shirt. If it's torn from the front, he is lying. If it's torn from the back, she is lying. So she is obviously proven untruthful here, but she insists on... Um, uh, pursuing him, and it becomes very difficult. A lot of gossip in the city. Everyone's talking about her, about how she she's this woman, this respectable woman, and she's trying to seduce this young man in the house. So she becomes uh, humiliated by all of the gossip and decides that she's going to show her friends so she invites them to come over to her place to, to have a banquet, to eat, and they eat. And then she brings out, any of you who, who have uh, eaten in a Middle Eastern culture know what happens when you bring out the fruit. The fruit is eaten with knives. So they're given bowls of fruit and they're given knives. So all the women have knives in their hands. They just start peeling the fruit and she orders Joseph to come out. Beautiful, dazzling Joseph. A story needs a, a, a beautiful, a hero. He is the star. He is handsome, charismatic. He comes out and the women, the women are, are so distracted by, by his beauty that the knife slip and they all cut their hands. Uh, so here, and there, there, there's, there's this very concrete aspect to this. The knife, the cutting of the hand, the fact that these women are, are in fact bleeding from their, uh, the, how dazzled they are by the beauty of Joseph. Joseph finds this just really getting to be too much, and he says, just, just, you know, I would rather go to prison than to be facing this uh, temptation and difficulty and harassment all the time. So he is thrown uh, into prison. Remember, Joseph was first thrown into a well, and now he's thrown into prison. In prison, he's there for a long time, and he meets two criminals. And uh, both of them, getting to know him, um, ask him to interpret their dreams. Each of them has a dream, and Joseph interprets their dreams, and uh, his... It, turns out that his interpretation is, is true, and this will be important for our themes. He asks uh, the one who he knows will be exonerated from his crimes, he said, remember me when you go out. When you get out of here, don't forget about me. He gets out, that guy gets out, 
and um, he forgets all about Joseph for quite a time, and Joseph remains in prison. But then the king of the land has a dream, and he dreams that uh, he sees seven fat animals being eaten by seven very skinny animals. And he sees seven green ears of corn and other dry ones. And he says, what does this dream mean? What does this dream mean? So the, the man who was in prison with Joseph says, hmm, I know someone who's a good dream interpreter. Why don't, you, uh, why don't we get him? The king says, where is he? He says, well, he's in the prison. So they bring him out. And Joseph interprets this dream. And he says, you need to um, sow grain for seven years in a row, but store most of it. Only take a very little bit out, store most of it, because after that, there will come seven very difficult years, years of drought, and you will eat pretty much all that's left, um, except uh, for, so you will need to have stored all of that. And then after that, there will be a relief from all of this. Um, and the king asks him then what happened with the women, and he, he explains this, and that finally, after all of this time, the woman comes forward and says, look, um, honestly, he's telling the true story. I, I repent. Um, I confess that I did something, and um, I ask for God's mercy. And so now the king, uh, Joseph, is exonerated. Uh, Joseph is now appointed by the king to be in charge of the, the uh, grain in the land and storing the food and the policy for making sure that um, there is enough for the people of the land. So this is one kind of settling. We've come to a point of ups and downs and hardship, uh, and now things are settled to some extent for Joseph. But now who comes back? His brothers. His brothers return to Egypt. And importantly, when they come, they don't recognize Joseph. They don't recognize him, even though he's speaking to them. And so Joseph uh, decides that now is the opportunity to teach his brothers a lesson. Um, and he tells them, uh, he tells them to bring their whole family, all the brothers. He wants his younger brother to come and uh, says, look, you know, you're not going to be able to have things settled here until you bring your brother. So they go back, they talk to the father and say, uh, look, they're saying the, the, the court is saying that we need to, to bring him. We have to go back. Of course, the father is very reluctant to send another son with them. He says, I just don't trust you. You have to, do you promise that he'll come back safe? And they say, we promise, we promise he'll come back safely. When he comes to the court, uh, Joseph takes the younger brother and, they, and he recognizes him. And he says, look, you know, it is me, it is me. I'm going to do something, just keep cool. We're going to do something to keep those guys a lesson. Secretly hides within their belongings, a goblet, um, and lets them go. Then he, he tells the guards, there's something missing here. Go search those people. They search him, and they find the goblet in the bags. They say, we don't know what this is. Um, if, uh, you know, we didn't take it. And he says, well, it's in, it's in this, uh, this boy's sack, so he must have been the thief. And they say, well, if he's a thief, his brother before him was like that. So they, they sell out their younger brother, and they also um, uh, disrespect Joseph, who is long gone by now. So he says, he says you, have to, uh, you have to leave him with me. They say, what's our father going to do? Well, they say, well, what can you do? So they go back to the father, and they said, we're so sorry. Your son has stolen um, we, we could not have stopped what we didn't see. We couldn't have guarded against the unseen. 
something that they didn't see, not know about. Now, of course, Joseph is so, so grieved, but he says this, there's something untrue about this. You are not telling me the whole truth. He becomes so sad and crying that his that he that he his eyes end up turning white and he goes blind. And they say, Why are you crying? Now you're crying for the son, but you're also still crying for Joseph. He says, Verily I complain of my anguish and grief only to God. So he says, Go back, go back, sons, and, and find out, try to see. Ask them, ask them about your brother, ask them about Joseph. Don't despair of God's mercy. Maybe there's a way. And so the brothers go back to the court and they say, please, you know, please, is there something you can do? Please be just, please be charitable. Our father's old. And the man says to them, you don't realize what you did, what you did to Joseph and his brother? that you weren't even aware. And suddenly the brothers recognize him. Suddenly the brothers say, are you Joseph? And they see him for who he is. He said, he says, yes, I am Joseph. And at this point, Joseph says, but I'm not going to blame you. I want you to take my shirt, take it back to my father and throw it over my father's eyes. They do that, and even before, even before they get there, Joseph's father says, oh, I can, I can, I sense Joseph, I I smell him. I smell Joseph. And then they bring the shirt, and his eyes are healed. And he says he knew that this would be, this would happen. So they all go back to Egypt, and now, uh, Joseph says, bring my parents, bring them in honor. And of course, the uh, prophecy or the dream that began at the beginning or that Joseph had at the beginning is fulfilled because his brothers all now must um, humble themselves before Joseph, who's in this great period uh, or this great position in the Egyptian court. They prostrate down in front of him. Joseph says, this is the fulfillment of my dream. Um, and the verse, uh, the Quran, and or this chapter, the story of Joseph enters, saying, uh, "These are the tidings of the unseen, which we, meaning God, have revealed to you, for you are not with them." Um, and at the very end, says, "Verily, in these stories are, is a lesson." <clears throat> so this is generally the plot with all of its ups and downs and twists and turns. So let's think about themes and how the themes come out in, in the objects and characters and dialogue. First of all, of course, there is the repentance theme. And the repentance theme is in the, the woman who tries to seduce Joseph, uh, the prisoner and the prisoners who, who do or don't repent of their misdeeds, the repentance of Joseph's brother. So part, one of the minor themes is that people can do wrong, they can do evil, they can be betray, but they may be forgiven again. So this is something that we see with a, a number of the characters throughout the story. There is the theme of patience. And it, the, the dialogue is interesting in this story. The theme of patience is, is is, is brought through the dialogue, especially, especially through these small little pithy statements that people make throughout. So one of the most famous um, uh, kind of prayers uh, or pieces, er, pieces of dialogue in the story that becomes a kind of prayer or supplication that probably all Muslims know is when Joseph's father says, patience is beautiful. You know, it's almost a bumper sticker. It's just very, very short. Sabru jameel. Patience is beautiful. It's two words in Arabic. Um, you can't get shorter, more impactful dialogue. So that this theme of patience 
through hardship and adversary is really summed up in this, in this, in this short uh, statement of Joseph's father. But patience, what does patience really mean? You know, sometimes I, because I teach chaplains, uh, this can become a, an almost, um, almost kind of throwaway comment uh, when people are suffering and they're a difficult situation. It's something that I would fail my chaplaincy students for saying to someone who comes to them with a lot of difficulty if the, if the sum of their counseling is, well, be patient, that's, that's not helpful. Really, that's not the end of helping someone who is in a very difficult situation. It might be the, the meaning of all of what you're going to say, but it not in and of itself is not the thing that is necessarily therapeutic. Um, and we're going to talk about therapy. But where does the therapeutic aspect come? It really comes through the deepest, most important message in this story, which is that um, whatever we know of the world, whatever we see of the world, whatever evidence there is or we have access to um, is not necessarily the same as truth. That there is an external reality and there is an internal reality. In Arabic, it's called the vahir and the batin, the exterior and the interior. And it is this world that we live in, with all of its evidence and proof, will very often lie to us. It will be untrue, and that what is true will be hidden. So if we start with um, uh, the places where this happens, think about, let's think about the shirts. The sh a shirt is a kind of uh, stand-in for the self. The, the, the shirt is like, is a stand-in to some extent for the person. The shirt is also what covers your outside. A shirt necessarily is, an exter is something exterior. And part of the beauty of this story is one in the repetition of this object. There are three shirts that are, that, are, that are mentioned or feature as important parts of this story. The first is the short shirt that the brothers bring back with the so-called lying blood, the fake blood that they use as proof that Joseph has been attacked by an animal and killed. So here they have the shirt with the blood on it. Evidence, right? But it is false evidence. It is fabricated evidence. It is evidence that is not true. And the one person in all of the story who knows that is the one person who is a prophet, whose knowledge of the world does not come from looking at the outside, but who has knowledge uh, of the inner reality or inner truth of things, which is Joseph's father, because he is a prophet. So he knows he is given access to some of the unseen and also has insight. So here we have the, the epitome of evidence, of material evidence, uh, which is the shirt, and it is a lying shirt. It's not true. It's, in fact, the exact opposite of the truth. The second shirt is the shirt that Joseph is wearing when the woman tries to seduce him. And of course, the shirt being ripped is an attempt for, for her to, uh, to corrupt Joseph's morality. Um, again, the shirt is part of who he, of, of what he is, is a, is a kind of synendosh, it's a, it's a substitute for who he is. Here we have a shirt that actually is exonerating. So now we've moved through the story from a lying shirt to a shirt that tells the truth. So this shirt gives evidence, but in this case, the evidence is truthful. And so we know that Joseph has started to move through his story because he has gone from a point where his shirt is used uh, to deny the inner reality, where his shirt is used to prove the inner reality or the truth. And the third shirt is 
Joseph's shirt that he takes off himself in order to heal his father. And in this case, the shirt is not only about truth, but it, it, is a, it is, brings a reconciliation of the inner and outer. What do I mean by that? Well, why did his father lose his eyesight? Losing the eyesight means that he no longer can see this world, yet he is, holds on to what is actually true. The world around him has betrayed the truth. It has all been lies. And so he no longer, it no longer serves the truth. He has, so he loses his sight, but he maintains his absolute faith that there is, that his sons are still alive and that God will get uh, him out of this. So Joseph, by bringing his shirt, which is exterior, but bringing it, bringing this uh, over his father's eyes, now he heals the rift between the outer and the inner. It is also the case with his brothers. His brothers, their eyesight is absolutely fine. They can see perfectly well, yet they stand before Joseph and don't recognize him. He's standing right before them, but they don't recognize him. He recognizes them because he is someone who sees the truth, who knows the truth. But his brothers are living in a world of lies, and that's why they cannot see him until they go back to Egypt with humility and start their process of repentance. And now, once they've undergone They've started this process of repentance. Suddenly, they become aware that this is Joseph. They see him. So this is this, this healing between their outer sight and the inner truth. The hidden theme again and again and again comes through. There is uh, the stored grain. Think about that, 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 that in order for the land of Egypt, for the people of Egypt to survive, they have to hide the grain away for seven years. They have to keep it away and out of sight. And then when they need it, they can pull it out. So there's, there's a treasure that is hidden and kept away for a time. And unless unless you are a prophet or unless you have understanding of the unseen, you will not be prepared to do that. You will not have patience. You'll go and you'll, you'll dig into those stores and you'll eat all of that up and you won't realize that whatever sacrifice it took to store that away, whatever difficulty you underwent during those seven years was for a reason. The reason was so that after you wouldn't starve. So that is part of, we have, to, we have to accept that some things will remain unseen and hidden and will, be, will ripen and come out at the time when they're really necessary and when it's good and right for us. Similarly, when Joseph hides the goblet, uh, the goblet inside the pack, um, so he now... He now is creating the situation where, uh, where the unseen, again, is uh, what is hidden and unseen is in contradiction to the truth. But he does that in order, in a way, to, to let his brothers start that process of awareness of what they have done by doing the same thing that they had done. Now, the goblet, we could say, is, is, uh, it reminds us of a crucible. A crucible is something in which, which, can, uh, which can hold, you know, hold a substance and be heated at a very high temperature. It's that when we talk about, about someone in the crucible, we talk about someone who's going through such difficulty. 
um, they're going through the fires, like Abraham going through the fire so his faith can come out pure. So we have this, this is a, this is a kind of archetypal um, symbol throughout storytelling. And let's think about what the crucibles are, and really the settings are the crucible. So if we think about the well in the prison, here we are, we have, we have Joseph like that grain being stored in a grain silo, or like this goblet being pushed down. He is, he is in this crucible, he is in this difficult situation, in this very tight, narrow, confined space where he can't interact very much with the world. What is the thing that purifies him, that makes him ready for prophecy, that makes him go from someone who, at the beginning, doesn't know the meaning of his own dream, has to ask his father, to being the person who can interpret dreams? It is by going through that crucible, by being pulled away from the world, by being hidden from the world for a time, so he can go through this process of maturation and of understanding, of going inside deep and understanding the reality and the truth of, uh, uh, of the universe, of the cosmos. So the dreams are also, we have this going deep into something dark. Joseph in the well, Joseph in the prison, the grain hidden in the stores, the goblet stuck down in the, merch, in the, in the bag. Um, and then the dreams, of course, three dreams throughout. And three is, a, is also an archetypal kind of number for storytelling, right? We had three shirts. We have, uh, we have a, a series of three dreams as well his initial dream where he sees the sun and the moon and the stars prostrating in front of him, and then the prisoners um, who narrate the dream in the, in the prison, and then the king who narrates his dream. So, but these are not only just, just themes that, that go throughout. Dream, a dream itself is unreal. It's knowledge that does not reflect the material world around us. It is, uh, it is meaning and a message cloaked in metaphor and symbolism. And so he needs to be able to interpret and understand what it is. So who is the, the person who can interpret? It is the one who really is, is guided by God, in particular the prophets. So this is why at the very beginning um, uh, Joseph's father says to him, says to him, your Lord will teach you the interpretation of events. So this is a whole process that, that uh, Joseph goes through. So he understands it's not just to be a soothsayer or you know, some kind of dream interpreter, but to actually understand and realize that uh, there is a deeper reality to things. Um, we may not understand it at that time, except for those prophets and those who are given insight by God into the meaning at that moment. Um, but an absolute conviction that 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 it, there is a reality, and that this world uh, very often will be deceptive. I'd like to say uh, finally, and then open up um, some time for discussion, that I believe in a. You know, not only is, uh, the story teaches us many, many things. Um, as I said before, I believe it is uh, uh, in itself, the fact that it is a beautiful story, that the Quran calls it a beautiful story, it tells us that, that this is a discourse that's important. It is valid, it is beautiful, it is beneficial, it is an important way of conveying messages and information in a pastoral context, in a congregational context. So we need, we need to understand the importance of storytelling and become good storytellers. But I also think that, uh, again, as someone who works sometimes in a chaplaincy context or in a pastoral context, I believe that, that the Joseph story is a beautiful healing story, that the process of reading the story again and again can in itself 
um, help heal people. Because it's very difficult for people who have been traumatized to always directly address uh, the point of their trauma. And sometimes it can make it worse. But a story that is filled with metaphor and symbolism and that takes you through these crucibles and brings you out um, is a, a way of bringing you through a process, a healing process that is not that might not directly um, exacerbate the personal trauma you have, but give that recognition to the traumatic experience um, that you have and that you know about. As I said before, when someone throws off in a, in a kind of thinking they're being helpful, saying something like, well, be patient, be patient with your suffering, as if the person isn't just trying to hold on, you know, very often it's, it's a kind of throwaway line. Whereas what, what is shown here is anyone who's, who's been uh, seriously depressed or in deep mourning or in a situation that was just intractable, they didn't know how to get out of it, knows that you feel like you're at the bottom of a well or you are in a prison and you don't know how to get out of that. Um, anyone, you know, I, I think everyone knows a little bit of it and many of us know at, at, a, at a very deep level what that feels like. So to have that experience being retold through a story that is manageable, that can be told um, and repeated again and has these, these multiple levels of symbolism, um, I believe, it's my theory, that this can be an extremely healing story. So I recommend that also in that context. Um, it's not just moralistic, it's not just listen to the lessons and this is what we do, but the actual story itself with all of its beauty, with its plot and symbols and, and repetition of different themes and the crucible and the hiddenness um, is something that appeals at a very deep level to the human imagination, perhaps even to our unconscious and can help um, with uh, uh, the healing process and there are so many people who need healing. So with that, uh, I'd like to close and um, offer an opportunity for some comments or questions. Thank you.